Good morning, Unity. Welcome. I'm so glad to see everyone here this morning. I am your announcement MC today. I've got several uh, other announcers that are going to come up and give announcements after I get the first ones out of the way. Uh, you already made it to church this morning. You've, I'm sure everyone was in Sunday school. Uh, we've got uh, junior high youth this afternoon at 4 o'clock, junior high and high school youth at 4 o'clock this afternoon. We've got a church council meeting at 5 today, getting fired up for that business meeting next Sunday. <laughs> We've got a card making event coming up on the, on the 20th. Uh, you're going to want to see Cindy Corzine if you want to get signed up for that. There is a, a, a small cost involved. Uh, I personally love the idea. I can't, I, I've never understood the idea of greeting cards where you're like, hey, look, I paid $5. Look what, what someone else wrote for you. And we've got the uh, church and community uh, information packets on the tables, uh, table out in the uh, entryway. And then uh, our first celebrity announcer this morning is Jane Gagas. Good morning, Unity family. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, who knows what tomorrow is? Oh, you guys said that kind of like tax day. It is like that, isn't it? Tax day, April 15th. But really what tomorrow is, Monday, that's good. Thank you very much. What tomorrow is, it's the deadline to sign up for the unknown tour. Isn't that great? The Women's Ministry of Unity will be going to the unknown tour. It is going to be a night full of worship and stories and I don't really know what all but it's going to be great. Um, the cost is $23. Woo, that's steep for an evening, but we're going to be VIPs because if Jane's going to do it, we're going to be a VIP, right? Woo! So we are going to meet here at four o'clock. Get it? May the force be with you. And the event is May the 4th. May 4th, four o'clock, meet in the church parking lot, Going to be great, going to be fun. Anybody who has access to a, a big old van, let us know so we can all ride together. Woo! Okay, thank you. Thank you for the reminder to file my taxes. I, uh, I, uh, I'm going to give up procrastinating next month. And uh, next up, our next celebrity uh, announcer is Shannon Boker for Vacation Bible School. Good morning, Unity. Um, not to be outdone by Jane, I, uh, I do have something. Hold on one second, I have to get into costume. All right, have you seen, and this is maybe age some of you a little bit, me too, have you seen the Blues Brothers movies back in uh, 1980? All right, well, in the Blues Brothers movie, there was a line that Elwood Blues and, and uh, Jake Blues said, and it was, we're on a mission from God. <laughs> we're putting the band back together. Now, I'm not putting the band together. What I'm doing is putting a crew of volunteers together for VBS. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about that here in a minute. I want to uh, encourage you to join me on this mission from God, because I'm on a mission from God. Um, now, so that I can see what I wrote on this paper, I'm going to remove these, get out of costume, and go back to myself. Okay? Um, so, parents, you can go ahead and register your kids, and I hope that you will do that now, and don't wait till the night, uh, the first night of Bible school, because there might be a line out there, if you register your kids now, you just breeze right on in and get started, okay? So be sure to get online, register your kids, invite as many people and as many kids as you can. We really want to outreach, make this an outreach um, effort out into the community. So invite as many people as you can. I, I'm going to kind of switch now and talk to you about, as I said, getting on this mission with me. Um, for those of you who have already volunteered, thank you, thank you, thank you. There have been quite a few. We've got quite a few people willing to help out. 
I'm going to give a huge shout out to the Duckworth family because <laughs> right from the get-go, every member of that family jumped in feet first. They started telling me what they were doing. They've already made up lists of things that they need for Bible school, and they've submitted them. They're on the go. They're, they're, that's the kind of enthusiasm and spirit we need here. So thank you, Duckworths. <laughs> And thank you to Shelly Parrish because Shelly has been a, she was the BVS director for a lot of years and she's really been helping me and making me feel better about this whole thing. So thank you, Shelly. Um, so, I, and I recognize that um, not everybody right now is in a season of their life where they can help, you know, come physically or to help financially or with donations. I get that. I understand that. God gets that. He, he knows. Um, but I do want to ask everybody, because everybody can do this. Everybody can pray. And we need to cover this Bible school in prayer. Uh, God knows who's going to show up. He knows what kids are going to be here. He knows what, what adults need to be here for those kids. So if he's speaking to you about this, um, I hope you'll listen. I hope you'll listen to his, his heart, your heart, and I hope you'll listen to him nudging you to come and help. Now, that being said, if I come approach you, I'm going to ask that you remember I'm on a mission from God, and I'm going to ask you not to turn and run away from me when I come walking up to you with my clipboard or my notebook, okay? So just stand there and let me approach you and listen, <laughs> okay? Um, and uh, I just want to thank you for your time, for listening to me. Um, I'll be back again, okay? So you all have a great Sunday. Oh, one last thing. This is, this is really cool. Parents, if you need to register your kids, there are flyers out on the table out there with a QR code. All you have to do is scan that QR code. You're going to go right to the place where you register your kids. Very easy. Okay? So thanks, you guys. Thank you, Shannon. I don't know about you guys, but I'm already picturing Pastor Jason and Jared dressed up as the Blues Brothers <laughs> Vacation Bible School for next year. Uh, thank you all for coming. Let's worship together. And um, so just to make it uh, official, I did once upon a time in an old life, in an old job, I was a day camp counselor, and I did do a full-fledged uh, song and dance Blues Brothers skit with uh, the shortest counselor in the uh, ranks. So we looked like the twins, but also Blues Brothers. So uh, maybe one of these Sundays you don't know, maybe Jason and I will uh, make it happen. So we'll have to see. We'll have to see. You guys excited to be here this morning? Hey Amen. It's good to see so many familiar faces. Good to see some new faces, as always. And I want to say happy birthday to Arlene Pickard. We want to wish Arlene a happy birthday this morning. We hope you have a great birthday, Arlene. Okay, brothers and sisters, are you ready to worship? Okay. We gather in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, saying, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church, we made it through another week. So maybe you come into worship this morning and you're walking here in shame. Maybe you come in and your heart has been defiled by hatred this week. Maybe you come in and you carry the weight of grief with you this morning. Maybe you come in and you've got the joy of the mountaintop. Maybe you come in and you've got the pain of the valley so close to you that you walk in with. Some of you are running and skipping in. Uh, some of you have not skipped in so many years that you wish you could. But some of you, my friends, have limped in. And I just want to say welcome. It is so good to have you here and worshiping with us. I want to make sure that we're clear about something. We are all invited to worship this morning. Not because any one of us is better than any other. Not because of what we have done, but because of who Jesus Christ is. That's our reason for worship. And so this morning in Hebrews chapter 10, the scripture says, Therefore, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold 
the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful, my friends. Church, if this is true, then nothing should hold us back. And so this morning, let's give all the glory to Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for inviting us into this place, God. I pray for every single person in this room, God, whether, uh, whether a seasoned believer, God, or just testing the water. God, whether you're on the mountaintop or whether we're in the valley, we just pray that you would draw us together with one voice, one heart, to sing your praises, to worship your son. Make this happen in spirit and in truth. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Friends, let's stand and greet one another in the Lord's name. Let's pass the peace of Christ. Hey, hey, hey. Let's sing together this morning. You guys ready? Let's do this. We've, we've, got a, we've got an incredible God who had this amazing plan from the beginning. We're going to sing a little bit about that story, just a part of it this morning. But a God who loved us so much that he sent his only son to give his very life for us. What an amazing thing that is. Ron, will you lead us in this first song? Everybody sing along. Let's do it. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross 
Shame is a prison as cruel as a grave. Shame is a robber, and he's come to take my name. I'm a redeemer, lifting me up from the ground. Oh, love is a power, but my freedom song is found. There ain't no grave. I hear that 
trumpet sound Gonna rise up out of the ground There ain't no grave
Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your open arms this morning. Lord, that we, many of us, we've come in with a limp, but God, you have welcomed us here. You have welcomed us into your grace, into your kingdom. Lord, into your uh, righteousness. God, so thank you. Thank you for the work that you're doing in our lives. God, thank you for um, the way that you're moving among us, the way that you call us back when we, when we, you know, head down the wrong path. Thank you for the way that, God, you restore us, that you heal us. The way that you have uh, an eternity in store for us, God. Thank you that we uh, are walking in freedom forever. Lord, thank you. We thank you. Thank you for this promise, this, this hope of, uh, of, of heaven, of a new heaven and a new earth, of complete restoration. Thank you for that promise this morning. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to sing one more together. Let's do this. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection shall. One shall gather to their home beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder. I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder. 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 a land that is fair of the day and by faith we can see it afar for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God, thank you for this time of worship. God, we pray that our hearts would continue to be open to you, that our minds would continue to be open to you, our whole lives, God, not just in the things we think as we hear something, but, Lord, may we truly enter into conversation this morning with your word and with your spirit. So we open ourselves. Here we are, Lord, uh, 
to hear you, to follow your way. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You can be seated, kids. Be blessed as you go. reading from the Gospel of Luke. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the gospel of the Lord, and the people said, Thanks be to God. All right, so here we are this morning. Hey, I want to say thank you to our worship team. What's great worship this morning? I think before Jason and I prayed this morning, he called it dirty worship. I thought that was a good adjective for it. Uh, That dirty worship was great this morning, so thank you very much uh, for leading us in song. Let me open us up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this invitation, God, to have your word open to us, to open our hearts, and Father, I pray, Lord, that you would use me in some small way in that. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, amen. So here we are this morning, we continue in uh, this, really it's been a long-term series called Moving Forward, and it's uh, basically my attempt to connect with the real issues and needs of younger generations, and for us to think about what it means uh, to have the gospel translate into their language. Now, the reality is, as I say each week, that uh, many, many younger generations are going elsewhere to seek out transcendent experiences and, and some form of community and acceptance, and My question is, does the church still have something to do with that? Another way of saying it is, does Jesus and the gospel have anything to do with younger generations? It's not a matter of what kind of a future we desire to have. It's a matter of if we want a future. That's really what it comes back down to, is what does the gospel say to current and future generations? And I believe this text this morning speaks to us. Uh, It begins with Jesus' appearance. Now, in case you didn't know this, the Easter is not just one day. It's a season that we celebrate after Easter morning. And so just so you're aware, uh, Jesus Christ is still, still risen from the grave. And this is what fuels uh, our turning to these stories this morning as Jesus reveals himself to his disciples. Remember last week when Jesus appeared to the disciples, he appeared very specifically to Thomas. And we talked a lot about what it means to have real faith, not cheesy faith, not what I like to call Diet Coke faith, but real faith, what it means to follow Jesus through the highs and lows and the reality of all situations in your life. This week, we pick up in Luke's final conversation between Jesus and his disciples just before he ascends to the Father. Luke's entire gospel after this text only has a few more verses. And so this final interaction, this back and forth that is shown is extremely important. 
When the disciples first see Jesus, they're terrified because they think they're seeing a ghost. And you know what we're talking about. Scary movies are terrifying. Um, worst decision I ever made was to watch Paranormal Activity when Sarah was at a women's retreat one night, and I terrified myself that night. That was the dumbest idea ever. Why did I pick to do that in a dark basement? That was terrible. They, they, they think they're seeing a ghost. Uh, they think they're seeing a disembodied spirit come through the door and be among them. But Jesus assures them right away this, peace to you, peace to you. More than one occasion, he says this, to squish fear. As I've said oftentimes before, the most repeated command in all of Scripture, 365 times, is do not be afraid, do not fear. And so Jesus appears to these disciples. He says what he said before, don't be afraid. Now, I want to make sure that you're aware that when Jesus proclaims peace, he's proclaiming something that is totally of God and not of the evil one. You ever know, do you know the difference between the spirit of evil, the spirit of the devil, and the spirit of Jesus? The spirit of evil never brings peace. The spirit of evil always brings fear, always brings complexity, always brings a divided heart. And what Jesus brings is restoration and peace and guidance and wholeness. The Holy Spirit always offers the peace of God. Now, it's really important this morning to recognize this, that we're not talking about peace just in the sense of kind of a forgetfulness of your sin and mistakes and all the turmoil that's in the world around us. It's a, it's a peace that's much bigger than that. Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And so because we practice, uh, my friends, when we practice persistent evil, what we'll say is unrepentant evil and sin, when we practice this in our lives, the last thing we experience should be peace. A wrestling within us, maybe somewhere deeper than we often reflect on and understand in our conscious awareness, but, but when we are walking in the darkness, the last thing that will happen is that we feel a sense of contentment and wholeness. Jesus comes to his disciples and he says, peace to you. And he says, see my hands, see my feet. He basically says, I am not a ghost, as you may think. I'm not a ghost. I am real among you. Elsewhere, he says, give me fish. It's, it's funny, he didn't say, give me a quarter pounder. You know, he says, give me, give me a piece of fish. That's what they had around. And as soon as they, as I said this last week, as soon as they see the fish enter into his mouth and not drop to the ground, they know they're not looking at Casper in front of them. They're looking at their Savior who they saw crucified and whom three days later rose from the grave. He's making his appearance to them, bringing them peace, bringing them assurance. This, in many ways, is what we have to wrestle with this morning, that Jesus' body is not a disembodied spirit. His body, the resurrected body of Jesus, is real flesh and blood, but flesh and blood that has gone beyond death and received the ultimate breath of life from God the Father. Now, we have to really deconstruct this because most of the time when we sing our songs about going to heaven, we think that that's the end, that our souls will rise and that's it. But the biblical story is so much bigger and goes further than that. And we'll get at this this morning. We begin a new existence on the other side of resurrection, my friends. The end of Revelation depicts this, heaven and earth coming together. No more suffering, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sadness anymore. It is because Jesus has conquered every last enemy, including death. So this morning, the risen Jesus appears to these disciples. Make no mistake, my friends, when we raise from the grave, the, the, the reality is that Scripture portrays the resurrection of Jesus to be the first fruits of what is to come uh, afterward, which is all those who have faith in his appearing, that all of us would rise from our graves as well, that our bodies, my friends, will not be floating around, that they will be physical in the most physical, tangible way, even more tangible than now, if you can begin to put your mind around that. The Apostle Paul writes that this goes beyond the physical, 
onto something even more fulfilled because of Jesus' resurrection. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4, Paul writes, While we were still in this tent, we groaned, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. What a great saying. What is mortal may be swallowed up by life. That we would be further clothed, further embodied in a spiritual way. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 44, so is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. What is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So just to make no mistake, my friends, this morning, to be spiritual in the most fulfilled way means that our physicality is filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And that resurrection, my friends, brings us to what Jesus says just after today's text in Luke 24, 49. He, he says this, and behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, the promise of the Holy Spirit. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Think about how Paul talks about the clothing of what is spiritual on us. What happens then after Luke's gospel ends is that Luke continues on in his account of how the embodied church, the risen church, what has begun in Jesus continues in us, how that church continues to be empowered and clothed by the Holy Spirit, and how the world begins to be changed by the way that men and women live like they are not dead. That's what happens in the book of Acts. And so, friends, I want to land on a couple things this morning. And the first is this. The resurrection is not simply something we look forward to happening after our life ends. Resurrection is what we begin to live here and now. The difference is a big difference between uh, just going to heaven with you die, uh, when you die and the kingdom of God reigning over all the earth now. There's a big difference in that. I've heard it said before that heaven is amazing, but it's not the end of the world. When you see a loved one, my friends, in glory, think about this. Maybe this helps it hit home. The hugs will be real. When Paul says that every knee will bow, the bending will be real. We're not talking about just some kind of mental picture somewhere floating up in the clouds, my friends. We are talking about real life, fully embodied, a physical become spiritual in a way that it's gone further than what it is here in this life. Resurrection isn't just something that happens in the end. Second Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes this, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. One of the greatest verses in all of Scripture, therefore, if anyone is in Christ... They are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Here, here and now, in this life, changing this life. In today's text, what command does Jesus give to his disciples? What does he tell them to do? Well, in verse 47, we see it. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Now, this is very different than maybe the popular image you have in your mind about some crazy nut job in Times Square standing with a sign on his chest running around saying, repent, repent, next to the crazy guy who's dressed like Superman going around taking pictures with everybody. The focus of the call to repentance is not everybody out there, first and foremost. My friends, Hear this, repentance and forgiveness are not only that which we proclaim. If you can put up this next one, Jennifer. They are what we are called to live here and now because resurrection is coming and has already spiritually began with us now. It's began with us now. Now, Jesus says that repentance and forgiveness are what should be proclaimed. Forgiveness is a little easier to understand. I feel like it's ten times harder. But we're going to focus this morning on repentance. So if we're going to talk about repentance, I want to get together on what repentance can mean. 
So here's a couple different definitions. Repentance can mean to turn back from sin to God. Oh, next one. That shouldn't be there. Keep going. Maybe just hear this. Now go backwards because I'm going to want to say all those pictures. So go backwards a couple. Just leave it there. Thank you very much. Hear these. Maybe I didn't include this in here. Repentance is to turn back from sin to God. Repentance is to turn back from worshiping false idols to the living God. Repentance basically means to change your mind. Repentance can mean, my my most favorite definition, repentance can mean to change the direction in which you are looking for happiness. To change the direction. And so, my friends, which fits you here and which fits you now? Which, Which aspect of repentance can reply and and respond to your life here in your circumstances. N.T. Wright says this, he says, it's widely used in the Old Testament and subsequent Jewish literature to indicate both a personal turning away from sin and Israel's corporate turning away from idolatry back to Yahweh. Through both meanings, he says, it is linked to the idea of return from exile. If Israel is to return in all senses, then it must return to Yahweh. This is at the heart of the summons of both John the Baptist and Jesus. In Paul's writings, it is mostly used for Gentiles turning away from idols to serve the true God. Also for sinning Christians who need to return to Jesus. So make no mistake. Make no mistake, my friends. Repentance and forgiveness should be proclaimed to all nations. But It begins first with God's people repenting and forgiving sins. It begins here. Before the crazy man goes out with the billboard out in Times Square, it begins here in this place right now. You know what the prophet said so many times? Repent, repent, repent. Turn back to God. Turn back to Yahweh. But who are the prophets writing to? Not the Gentiles. They're writing to the people of God who turned away. So what would it be like if every Sunday when we came into church, if we took turns wearing the sign of repentance, and as people walked in, we rang a bell and said, repent church, repent church, repent church, wouldn't that be something? That's the call. It's the call to the church to be the greatest repenters, to be the men and women who are most willing to turn back to God, most willing to turn back to God. Now, let's see if this is up here. Let's see if I didn't get this all jumbled. Next slide. No, I got it totally jumbled. Who knows? There we go. There we go. Now, you may remember last week that that this category of people called the nuns, that it's been rising and rising and rising, uh, peaked uh, during COVID. It's dropped a bit, but it's, make no mistake, continually on the rise. That it's this group of people that nearly one-third of the U.S. population doesn't want anything to do with organized religion that given all opportunities to check a box to say what do you most identify with or what do you most gravitate toward, that nearly one-third of the population checks none of the above. And that should have something to do with what we say and even more importantly with what we do, how we live our lives. Can you guess a major reason why people don't want to attend church services? Can you guess a reason? Well, I I put my slides all out of order this morning. I don't know what. I need a spiritual mentality, I think, somehow, a a mindset. Just hear this. The greatest thing that withholds people from coming to church only surpassed by the box that says, I don't agree. Number two is hypocrisy. It shows it up here. Praise the Lord. Number two, you can't read it. But number two on the list is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy perceived within the church. The word hypocrite, let's see if this works. It's a miracle. The word hypocrite ultimately came into English from the Greek word upon which means actor. 
or stage player. The Greek word itself, it's a compound noun. It's made up of two Greek words that literally translate an interpreter from underneath. That what you see on the surface is not what's happening behind the mask. Actors in ancient Greek theater wore large masks to mark which character that they were playing. And so they interpreted the story from underneath a mask that looked very different from who they were. That's what a hypocrite was. My friends, the lack of repentance in the church is not due to an inability to live holy lives, but rather the way in which we cover up our mistakes and failures while acting the part of people who have it all together. That's the reason why people don't come to church. Either that or they don't agree altogether. It's they see us living one way, and yet when we come together on Sunday morning to play church, we say something very different. I won't tell that story. I won't tell that story either. Uh, They make me look too bad, I'll just say. (laughs) Oh, I'll say this. All right, I'll say this. I used to, in in my first job in ministry, Sarah's really worried right now what I'm going to say. In my first job in ministry, I I built all kinds of relationships with people all over the place. And the most surprising encounter that would ever happen is when I would recognize somebody that I had been ministering to when they walked in and saw me in the bar. You're not laughing because it's happened to you. (laughs) You're like, I remember when that happened. The lack of repentance is when we say one thing, and yet when we are seen for our true colors, we represent something totally different. In 1 John, the apostle writes this. He says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not within us. Now, you you got to put your thinking cap on here for a second. I know it's Sunday morning. But listen, in in 1 Corinthians 15, one of the earliest writings of the Apostle Paul, Paul writes this, he says, I am the least of the apostles. He says, I am unworthy to be called an apostle. Which means, he says, I'm the last place among 12 of them. But yet, in 1 Timothy, near the end of his ministry, this is what he writes. He says, this is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. You see the progression. I'm, I'm, I'm the most unworthy of this small group over here. And then after decades of serving God and knowing him more, he could confidently say, I am the worst of all sinners on this planet. One of my great mentors in life, Walt Enoch, passed away last year. I said, Walt, what are you learning in your spiritual life in this season of your life? He was like 84 when he answered this question. He said, I am more aware of my sin than I've ever been aware of in my entire life. And I am more aware of my need of the cross of Jesus and the grace of God. And that's what sanctification looks like. That's what it looks like to grow in knowing Jesus in your life. The, unfortunately, what we see from the Christians, let me, let me just say this, what we see by what's represented here, let's say, just say on social media, are Christians who do a better job arguing people out of the kingdom rather than winning people into it are Christians who are so good at looking like they have all the right answers. Christians who represent that they are so amazing and that everybody else is so bad. You know the difference, my friends, between a Christian and a non-Christian? There's one difference, repentance and faith. That's actually two things, but it's, it's wrapped up. You know what I'm saying. That I'm, I'm humbled sometimes when I encounter people who are not of the faith, who are more down to earth and accepting of their reality than I am. 
the difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is repentance. One is willing to accept my brokenness, my sin, and willing to bring that to God. That's the difference. And so the ultimate question, my friends, is how can repentance become part of the church culture? That's really the question. Last week, the question that I left you with, if we stop talking about the food and the weather all the time, I thought about this because I encounter a crossing guard every Sunday or every morning. And as I'm walking back, I'm, I'm wondering now, what do I ask him? What do I say to him? Because we used to always just talk about the weather. So he was going on a fishing trip this weekend. I hope it goes really well. Last week, we got to the ultimate question. What, if, what, what would it do to change our fellowship if the first thing on our lips when we saw each other on Sunday morning was, how is your faith? What if we went one step further and the second question on our lips toward each other was, how's your repentance? Oh, man. I wonder how rich our fellowship would grow in that. How many, how many walls would come down? How many of our fake smiles would just be exchanged for reality? In Luke 18, there's a story of a Pharisee and a tax collector that Jesus told. The Pharisee's prayer is so good, and I believe that he actually lives most of it out. But the sinner, the tax collector, simply said, God be merciful on me, a sinner. And Jesus says that he was the one who went back down to the city justified. Repentance, my friends, is for the church. James 5 gives us one particular answer. How can we saturate our church culture with this? James writes, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power and it's working. Do you see that, that last part, the prayer of, of faith of a righteous person, has less to do with praising, uh, praying for these unbelievable, unbeknown miracles. It has everything to do with confessing and forgiving and repenting. The prayer of a righteous person is so faithful. And so, friends, I want to make sure that you're aware of this. Evil loses power when we expose it from within ourselves and allow God's forgiveness and grace to reign over our lives. It loses its power. There can't be anything held against you by Satan if you've already confessed it and made it known to the Lord. So you think about all these accusations walking around. You're, you're nobody. I saw what you did last night. I saw what you did on your phone. I saw that hatred in your heart. I saw the way that you gossiped about that person. And if, if your response to that is, well, God already knows all that stuff. So what else do you have to say? That's what happens when you repent. My friends, what kind of a community would this create within us if we lived out this call to repent? To, to not be hypocrites. To not be hypocrites in the fact that we are honest with ourselves and that we are honest with others. And ultimately, we are honest about who Jesus is. Think about how different our marriages would be. Think about how different our parenting would be. Think about how different our friendships would be if we repented together. Not one time on a Sunday morning, but as a lifestyle, my friends. If we can be this repenting church, then my friends, I believe with all my heart that our future is bright. Because I believe with all my heart that this kind of a community cannot ultimately be found outside of Jesus. It can be found here. It can be found through ultimate acceptance, ultimate confession, ultimate restoration, ultimate grace. So my friends, we have a lot to offer for people who think we're just hypocrites. The question is, do we want to offer it or do we want to keep just playing church? May God bless the preaching of his word. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray over the addicts in the room who have not confessed. God, I pray over the hidden sins that we hide from others. God, I pray for all the things that we think hold us back from your love. God, it's all an illusion. It's all fake. 
Nothing holds us back because of the blood of Jesus Christ. So God, help us to live like the curtain has been torn in two, that we can access you in the Holy of Holies, God, that we have the freedom to walk in because of your love. And so I pray this morning against hypocrisy. I pray this morning for a fully realized faith, that we could do it together. God, that none of us are firing on all cylinders on all days, but Father, that through the help of our brothers and sisters, that we can continue to learn to repent. And so, just as Jesus offers, Father, his disciples, I pray this morning that you would offer us your peace. Bring freedom from unrepentance. And Lord, lead us to turn back to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, I want to invite you to stand. And the invitation is this. The invitation is to come to the light. Let the light shine. Experience the freedom of God's grace. Let his love bask over your greatest struggles. You don't have to hide it anymore. My friends, we can be the community of the faithful because we repent. It's for us. Let's be that church this morning. From wherever you've been, come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Lay down your burdens, lay down your shame, all who are broken, lift up your face. So lay down your hand, lay down your heart, come as you are. There's hope for the hopeless, and all those who have strayed, come sit at the table, come taste the grace, there's rest for the weary, the rest that is has no sorrow that heaven can't cure. So lay down, come on. So lay down your no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. 
My friends, as we begin to come to the close of our worship, I want to invite you to add to your worshipful acts, your giving of your offerings to the Lord. The place where we give those offerings out of the abundance of our heart, thankful for what God is doing in our life. We call them the joy plates. I just invite you to give as God leads you to give. Uh, Church, I want to read a scripture to you. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. My friends, the only way that repentance works in a church is if there's no judgment on the other side. When you confess your sins, when you believe that what will be found by you is forgiveness, not hypocrisy. Forgiveness, not judgment. And so I just encourage you, if you think you're walking somewhere right now that nobody else has been, I promise you that's not the case. Many of us have just covered it up really well. But I tell you what, if you are walking in the light, you will find brothers and sisters who are stumbling, yet stumbling forward to walk in that same light. And so let's be that church. Let's be that church who repents. Let's be that church who forgives. Let's run the race together. Let's come to the light together. My friends, let's experience the peace of Jesus Christ together and share it with others. My friends, you have everything you need. Now go and live like it. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so go. The service is ended. Go and announce the gospel of our Lord. Go forth and glorify the Lord by your life, by your broken life, by your mistakes, by your repentance. My friends, go forth in peace and proclaim to all who care to hear. Amen. Alleluia. Let's say this together. Our God reigns. Let me close this in prayer. Father, I pray this morning that you would bring us a spirit of freedom. God, help us not to jump past repentance to get to that freedom. God, I pray that you would show us what it means that that we could find total acceptance in your sight. But first, give us the trust to bring everything to you, to confess it, to bring it to you, God, to be healed in it. And so this morning, I pray for your offer to saturate our fellowship, that we could be the people of God that is willing to be honest together, willing to accept each other, willing to walk closer to your son together. In Christ's name we pray, amen. God bless you all. Have a great week.